My name is Edward Abrahams. I am president of the Personalized Medicine Coalition, an education and advocacy organization for those of you who may not know us. Our mission is to accelerate investment in and adoption of personalized medicine. As you know, this morning, PMC released a white paper titled Using Health Data to Advance Personalized Medicine, which we have sent to all the participants in this webinar. Because the paper addresses issues that are not going to go away, I hope you'll read it and refer to it in the future as a discussion about how to integrate data into healthcare evolves. The purpose of the white paper is to set the stage for continued consideration of using data to improve and advance personalized medicine by bringing together in one place a definition of the opportunity that lies in front of us and a recognition of the challenges that opportunity faces. To put today's discussion in context, I want to reference three facts that will condition this webinar as well as the future consideration of where we go from here. First, the promise of personalized medicine of better outcomes for patients and greater efficiency for health systems rests on our ability to aggregate, analyze, and share data, both from, the, both from patients, uh, patient encounters with the health system, and increasingly with the digital world. By so doing, we can help ensure that each patient's biological characteristics, behaviors, and environmental circumstances help inform his or her medical interventions. As it has elsewhere, data has the capacity to greatly improve the delivery and efficiency of healthcare. Second, we know that a large chunk of the American public does not trust so-called learned intermediaries, otherwise known as healthcare providers. We know this because 35% of the public has refused to get vaccinated, not a small number and not a statistic without significance for healthcare. We're going to have to grapple with the issue of trust in the future. And third, while Democrats and Republicans may not agree on much today, upwards of 80% of both, according to a recent poll, believe that Congress should make privacy law a priority, which may or may not impact the future of integrating data into healthcare. To help us work through both the opportunity and the challenge defined by our white paper, I'm delighted to welcome to this PMC webinar, the principal author of our report, Greg Downing, and the two and two of the three co-chairs who shepherded through PMC's ad hoc PMC working committee on data. Unfortunately, Lauren Silvis, Senior Vice President of External Affairs at Tempest and former Chief of Staff at FDA under Scott Gottlieb is unable to join our conversation because un she has unfortunately come down with a case of COVID. I'm sure that everyone joins me in wishing her a speedy recovery. But in alphabetical order, the participants of today's discussion are Greg Downing, founder of Innovation Horizons, a consulting practice specializing in innovation and technology adoption in healthcare, whom PMC commissioned to help us sort out using data in healthcare. Greg has a long history of working in government, including stints directing personalized medicines development in both the Bush and Obama administrations. He is also a, has an active practice in pediatrics and maternal newborn critical care. Second is Chris Joshi, Executive Vice President for Network Solutions at Change Healthcare, whose mission is to leverage insights and data to improve healthcare systems. Chris has significant corporate experience, having worked in senior strategy positions at Oracle, IBM, and McKinsey. He holds a PhD in physics from MIT. And finally, Mike Vesconsales is 
chief medical officer of Flatiron Health, also a data company dedicated to improving patient care and accelerating cancer research through its products and services. Mike has worked in drug development at Unum Pharmaceuticals, Takeda, and Drenzyme. He received his medical degree from Northwestern University. To open the discussion, I want to ask the panelists to explain why data is so important for the future of personalized medicine, and if possible, to give us an example of how aggregating and analyzing data has improved individual and public health. Let's start with Chris. Chris, why is data so important for the future of personalized medicine? Hi, Ed, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to join you all for this discussion today. So thank you for having me. So being at Change Healthcare, which is a company that provides networks to connect all the different stakeholders in healthcare that include providers, payers, labs, pharmacies, we found ourselves in an interesting position when COVID hit. We found that a lot of questions were being asked. Who is being impacted? How much? Where can telehealth help? Where are the underserved communities? And importantly, what treatments might work? Like what treatments might work? What is working? What is not working? And these questions needed quick answers. And that required up-to-date data that, that spanned the country. It couldn't just be concentrated data from one place. People really needed broad data from across the country. We put in place a program um, very rapidly with over 50 different academic institutions to help them get access to our data. We cut through all the red tape and we got them that access for the, for the, to the data. And we did it all for free. And we basically told them, go have at it and go answer these questions that you're eager to answer. And that resulted in tremendous insights, which were possible because the data was almost up to the, up to the minute and it was broad. And we gave a lot of different people without any constraints to access, permission to access that data for, uh, for nonprofit research use purposes. A lot of those papers are still coming out from that research. What we're working on now are ways in which we can get other institutions to similarly make data available in a way that is easy to access, that is protected, yet can be sampled and, uh, and used when, uh, when time is of the essence. So that is just one example of how aggregated information when presented and used appropriately with the right protections can be very useful from a, just from a national public health perspective. But the same principle I would say applies for research around specific therapeutics as well. We do have a challenge in this country around clinical trial participation, especially in the underserved communities and in the community health settings. So data and availability of data from those settings can also make a big difference. Great, thanks. Uh, Mike, what's your take on why data is so important uh, for the future of personalized medicine? Well, first of all, um, I want to step back. I'll get to that question in a minute, but I, I first want to just step back for a moment um, and uh, uh, really congratulate the Personalized Medicine Coalition, uh, Dr. Downing and, and his team for bringing us to this moment in time today. Um, the, at, at Flatiron, um, as we learned about this project many months ago, we were um, enthusiastic supporters really from, from, from the beginning and it's great to be with uh, you all today. Uh, so why were we so enthusiastic uh, uh, you know, back last year when, when we started down this path? Well, Chris has really nicely just summarized uh, uh, the contributions that Change Healthcare has brought to the, the world that we've been living in for the last couple of years. There's been many other opportunities, I think, to accelerate the, the dialogue around uh, the topic that we're going to be touching on today as a really a silver lining to the pandemic. We also uh, are at this point in time where technologic uh, progression independent of the pandemic and scientific applications of a whole variety of disciplines to the world of healthcare data are converging with really important discussions that Ed also alluded to with respect to individual privacy concerns as we, uh, as we uh, negotiate through this uh, new world. And then finally, there's policy and regulatory uh, frameworks that are falling into place that really um, are uh, put together with everything else I've just mentioned, cr creating a convergence that 
really sets us up for a, like a perfect moment in time in my uh, uh, in, in, in in my perspective for uh, being here to talk about the output from uh, the work that the that the Precise Medicine Coalition has has really commissioned uh, leading up to today. You know, there's a um, there's a vision statement um, in the document that uh, uh, really resonated with me. Um, personalized medicine really rests on the promise of sharing and aggregating data. I uh, completely uh, believe that. And uh, I, th I think nicely through uh, the white paper, we talk about how um, maximizing clinical data, um, ensuring its integrity, and really precluding barriers to research and improved applications in healthcare are critical policy considerations, which is really the sort of the foundation of, uh, of, of much of the, uh, the content that, uh, that you'll be, you know, that you'll be uh, uh, reading when you, when you dig into it. I guess in short, what I'd say is that um, information or data drives insights and foundationally from the perspective that uh, we have at Flatiron Health and that I have as a clinician and uh, a cancer researcher, it, uh, it's the greater integration of research with, uh, uh, with clinical practice uh, and the insights that will come from that convergence that uh, is exactly the moment in time where we're at and that I uh, look forward to um, look forward to talking about further. Now, as it relates to, to, to Flatiron Health, for those who may or may not have some familiarity with, uh, with our focus, we, we are focused on oncology. And for most of the past decade, we've been working uh, uh, predominantly with uh, uh, clinicians uh, to help improve their um, the care of their patients through uh, the, the the products and services that we uh, can provide to them in their everyday everyday work, whether that's in, uh, in, in the community, which is a, a substantial focus of our efforts, but, but also larger health systems and academic medical centers. We also have uh, progressed the, the 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 learning and understanding and the insights that come from really aggregating patients' journeys in ways uh, that uh, allow uh, cancer researchers to. Uh, to advance their um, understanding around a whole variety of care and, uh, and, 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 and clinical research questions. Um, we are actively uh, creating tools and solutions in, in the United States and, and, and more recently outside of the United States to continue to progress uh, the um, improvement in clinical care and, 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 and glean insights from uh, the research that we can uh, that we can either support or, 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 or drive with our own uh, internal clinicians and scientists. And then given the scale that we've been able to uh, create in the context of oncology, we're really well positioned to, uh, to help promote greater access and, and, and health equity uh, ac across the spectrum of the areas that we're focused on. So um, that's a, a little bit about why I think data is important. And I think um, uh, I'll turn it um, back to Ed and uh, hopefully talk about some examples of that uh, as we move along. Uh, Greg, you, you've uh, been working on this for almost two decades. Um, and I would be very interested to know, you know why you think uh, data is so important and what it can do uh, to advance personalized medicine, improve healthcare, and if if you can give us an example, even even uh, an end of one. Yeah, <clears throat> well, well, thank you, Ed. And uh, first of all, I really want to encourage the valued members of PMC and others uh, to really read the report. It's, um, I think, breathes life into what the future of personalized medicine uh, is and about to be. Uh, we really set out three um, markers, I think, that focus around the utility of EHR data so much work over the last two decades has gone into applying that throughout our country and, and making healthcare more efficient. It's now a way for us to communicate. Um, the second area is really in the aspect of real world data, which to many is probably they either thought this was happening already or uh, they don't understand it. But the context of being able to take remote patient monitoring data or your Fitbit data or other data and lifestyle data to really answer some of the critical questions that explain the differences. Uh, and then this privacy issue that you've already addressed, which is really an important uh, aspect. Uh, but most importantly about this report, um, uh, and it was such a pleasure working with, uh, <clears throat> with Mike and uh, Chris and, uh, and Lauren on this to understand how they see this from their corporate viewpoint and then the other 
members of the working group. And I also really want to thank uh, Liza Greenberg and Chris Wells who um, helped helped us bring this communication and the inputs along the way uh, to make this happen. So thank you for that. Um, uh, your, the credit is yours. Uh, but these are words of really progress. I mean, the companies that are represented here represent innovation in contexts that you couldn't have even imagined a decade ago. And they're represented here because they are the engine that churns that data into actionable knowledge. And that's what's really different about, about where we are today. And for those that you know may have questioned, you know the appropriateness or the even the capability of uh, applying personalized medicine to practice, um, just a generation ago, um, we're here, and there's a ways to go for everyone to benefit from this. But we're seeing the benefits of of our genomic investments, data sharing coming to life, and. Most importantly, I think um, this report has words of hope and opportunity blended in them. Trust is that that intersection of those two features of it. And I really think that's an important reflection point for all of us today. Um, so I think overall what we're trying to do is, you know, instill some superpowers to practitioners and patients alike that will make that data actionable and more informed and uh, committed in terms of sharing uh, the roles that patients have in their own care. So I wanted to share a story that some of you have heard already and, and the patients uh, been um, prominently sharing her own views of um, personalized medicine. And um, about five years ago or so, Flora, uh, who's from Overland Park, Kansas, uh, was diagnosed with a very advanced um, type of gastric uh, adenocarcinoma. Um, and for a variety of reasons, she's the mother of eight kids. She's uh, works in biotech herself, um, you know, knew that there was something wrong, but really didn't explore it. And it wasn't until a biopsy and uh, an MRI that revealed a very disseminated form of this that was frankly at her cancer center, was given a very poor prognosis and, you know, told, get your things in, in order. And she and, um, took it upon herself then to basically arm wrestle uh, with her providers and the health systems to get the data and get the tissue samples. And um, ultimately got a whole genome scan. I remember the day when uh, she, Tempest actually did the sequencing for her and armed with that went across the country with her data to find different cancer centers and programs that could potentially help with the signatures of her tumor. Uh, she found Dr. Shimei Kaito at the University of California, San Diego and who customized her molecular therapy throughout her course and with multiple biopsies and scans and things were able to customize for her a really successful regimen and uh, talked with her last week and she's cancer free today um, and is back to her routine life. And I'll share more at the end of this, but I think this is the kind of scenario where we don't need patients necessarily fighting, fighting the system, but to use their data and that of the science enterprise to connect with the experts who have the best knowledge. And I know other members of Personalized Medicine Coalition are really committed to that. And that's part of why this paper is so important. So Ed, um, back to you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna push back a little bit on the answers that we've just heard to what, why data is so important. And noting that we have been talking about this for really over a decade about integrating data into healthcare and making decisions based upon the aggregation and analysis of large data sets. And um, my question to the three of you, beginning with Chris is, why is it taking so long? What's, what's the holdup? What's the difficulty? So that uh, when, when patients meet their healthcare providers, they don't, aren't able to access these big data sets that could inform their treatment um, the way that we've seen data reshape other parts of our society. Chris, do you want to take a stab at that? I know that would be an unfair question, but it's on my mind. <laughs> Indeed, uh, this, is, uh, this has been a big question uh, for now the better part of two decades, right? Since uh, the country invested billions of dollars in putting in uh, electronic health records, the vision was that all that electronic data would be used for, for great purposes, for research and, and population health management and public health and everything else. And you know, as we've dug into this, and now really going back uh, uh, at least a decade and a half, 
we realized that the challenges um, are multifaceted. There continues to be a business model challenge and a regulatory challenge um, because on the one hand, uh, we want people to use data and share data and aggregate data. On the other hand, we wanna protect privacy and make sure that we don't inadvertently you know, open a door where in the interest of, of, of any purpose, frankly, we don't accidentally trip uh, over privacy issues. So uh, that's sort of one, one area. The other, which is somewhat technical, but I'll dwell on it here for just a moment because it doesn't get the attention I think it deserves, is proper identity and consent management. Seems like a very technical GORPI kind of issue, but the reality is our data today is spread out across many different locations in healthcare. The drugs that you take on a regular basis, that record is typically with your pharmacy. Maybe some of that record is with one of your physicians or your PCP, but you may have multiple physicians prescribing you medicine. So it may be distributed. Your uh, surgery record might be in one place. Your primary care record might be in another place. But when you try to get a full view of where all your information sits today, it is difficult because each one of these different systems in the background has a different identity for you. It's not like the banking system where they can recognize and identify you with a social security number and identity proof you to, to be able to move your money. You wish that you could do record matching and identity matching in healthcare with the same uh, simplicity, with the same level of, uh, uh, of access and simplicity, but we can't. And that is one of the technical challenges that uh, makes it difficult, even when you have data sets and when you have access to the data sets, to match them up accurately. Because as you might imagine, the threshold for accuracy is very high, as it should be. You don't want to accidentally combine two different people's records as one, you know, even if that happens once, one in a million records, right? That error rate is too high. You don't want one in a million people being impacted by incorrect data. So the threshold for accuracy is incredibly high. Infrastructure is somewhat lacking and the data is fragmented. So we really need better standards and a, and a push towards better identity and record matching combined with more universal and more consistent consent management because we don't really wanna move data and combine data without patient consent. So those are some of the things that come to my mind, Ed. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, Mike, you wanna to add to that? Why it's taking long to realize this vision? Um, sure, before I, before I uh, uh, try to comment on that question, I do wanna circle back. Uh, I, I think Greg gave a really powerful anecdotal story um, that I'm sure many of us have ourselves. It's a, a, a sort of a two sides to the coin of the story. It's really nice to hear uh, that this woman facing a really life-changing event found the physician who could really provide focused and targeted therapy that's making a difference, but it's also a call to arms, right? And uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's anecdotally very reminiscent of one of the examples of how we see the impact um, uh, of data already, at least at Flatiron Health. You know, um, I would say that we've progressed to the point in terms of working with researchers on um, targeted data sets where there's, there's really no gap in time anymore, where um, uh, if we think about how the understanding of cancer biology has progressed to the point where increasingly, uh, building data cohorts around the histologic basis of the cancer is really incomplete to the research question being asked. So now we're looking at biomarkers and increasingly uh, uh, and predominantly actually genomic markers to build those data sets. And those have been incredibly helpful from a variety of perspectives and standpoints around questions of understanding the natural history of those smaller populations um, that are defined by, by, by those targets. Uh, that's important for drug developers. It's important for regulators to understand those populations. And, um, and, and as the definition of those populations get refined, the, the numbers get smaller and smaller. And so how can you ever hope to understand those populations if you aren't aggregating the data in a way, curating in a way, and linking it importantly to uh, important components of the data, like the underlying tumor genomic data, to be able to even begin to ask those questions. So that's just one example you asked us before the session today. And to try to be concise, I think I could probably spend the rest of the hour giving you examples of how uh, aggregation of data, at least in the cancer space, is, is uh, really 
su substantially moving the needle, uh, but, uh, but I'll, I'll pause there and try to circle back to the question of wh why is the realization of the vision taking so long? I'm gonna turn that a little bit on its head. Uh, as, a, as an optimist, I would say, I'm gonna challenge the, the, the premise of the question a, a little bit. Um, Chris mentioned a, a, a decade and, and, and change that uh, we've had the kind of foundational uh, legislation that's allowed us to even have a conversation like this today. And we've had uh, substantial policy areas of focus that have translated into meaningful progress in that past decade uh, uh, ever since uh, uh, if we start uh, sort of ground zero, if you will, at the high tech and ACA. Uh, legislation. So, uh, in particular, I think, uh, uh, and not to single anyone, uh, one uh, piece of policy success out over others. But I think the the Cures Act, certainly from from a real world data and, and oncology perspective, has been meaningful. And we were just uh, going about implementing that when we're uh, actively talking about what a Cures 2.0 uh, uh, progress can uh, can look like. So, in my mind. Um, a 10 or 12 year period isn't that long. And especially when you think about the fact that it's not been linear, uh, and at least from, from our vantage point, I think it's been more like a hockey stick and the slope of change over the last few years is far greater than the first few years. And so um, uh, I, I think, I think the, 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 the reality of the vision is, 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 is in full swing and there's a paradigm shift occurring and we're in the midst of it. And I think it's important to keep that in mind from the vantage point that we see the paradigm shift is really the convergence of clinical care and, and research, which uh, we'll probably touch on a couple more times in, in the next hour. But that's, uh, th that's the perspective that I have to the question that you asked. Thank you. Uh, that's a great answer to, to my question. And of course, I think my question is obviously conditioned uh, by uh, our appreciation of how things move so quickly in the tech world. Whereas when we started the uh, uh, Personalized Medicine Coalition, I'm often reminded uh, Mark Zuckerberg was still in a Harvard dorm. And, and so things move fast in that world. And that world has also uh, moved rather rapidly into, or at least it says it has, or is, or is going to, uh, in, into the world of healthcare. And so uh, with that as a perspective, Greg Downing, can you share with us your perspective on if it's taking so long uh, and uh, what's likely to happen uh, as tech moves into uh, uh, the aggregating and analyzing healthcare data. Yeah, so I, I think about this from two perspectives. One is that as a, as a physician and uh, the world I see evolving uh, right now. And that, and that also from coming from you know, 30 years in Washington and from the physician side, and, and part of this is, I think, leveraged by the COVID experience is that uh, I don't know of any of my peers, or I'm sure in the audience today, that anyone would disagree with the pace of change and that almost every day you're faced with new protocols or new decision points or new ways. And at times it's mind boggling and results in lots of stress, but, it, but this is progress. And, uh, I think back to over the last 20 years when SARS-1 and Ebola came out, we were barely able to get some signals from the EHR systems on how to deal with this from a public health perspective. We could send messages from CDC and others, but to be able to look at aggregate data from EHRs uh, 20 years ago was impossible. Um, and today, you know, the culmination of being able to use technologies and use EHRs and integrate that with uh, <clears throat> public health data and uses of um, cell phone tracking data and be able to aggregate information. You can even start to predict in some ways what, what's likely to happen. Um, on the public health side, I think you know one of the things that I've noticed is that while in mainstream healthcare, the EHR adoption, the interoperability work and the standards work went on, but there are, this has not been ubiquitous and even in its distribution. So in areas of behavioral health and in public health in general, um, you know, there's still very profoundly pockets of healthcare where there are not electronic health records that are, are there to be able to support um, these situations. And so there's a lot of the, um, 
last mile kind of work that needs to go into those areas and often where the most desperate people live are underserved by these capabilities. And that really represents an opportunity uh, for personalized medicine to be able to address those areas of health equity. We've got to get the technology to the people that don't have it yet and make it affordable and accessible to them and, and usable and understandable as part of their lives. So those, those are some of the challenges. Now, I, I think you touched earlier on some of the privacy concerns. Those are ubiquitous throughout our human endeavors these days. And um, we need a balanced approach to this in healthcare that doesn't impede progress. And yet there's gaps in our protective systems that don't address uh, areas of healthcare that we engage in increasingly so outside of a formal EHR or a health system in general. So there's uh, a ton of work yet to be done, but I think that the key message today is the pace of progress and at sometimes it's just dizzying in terms of being able to know where we're going, but it's, it's really that the opportunity is there and we're, you know, we're going to do better at this as we just keep doing the iterations and the churns on it. Um, there's so much opportunity for innovation right now uh, that one can only be hopeful about this landing in a really good place for, for everyone. So uh, is the anxiety about privacy going to be a road barrier to the development of, of this vision of aggregating and analyzing uh, data and uh, to integrate it into clinical care? Um, I mean, let's start with uh, Chris on that subject. Is, is, is our concern for privacy a problem? Well, first of all, Ed, privacy always should be a big, big consideration whenever you're dealing with uh, sensitive patient data um, at any scale. So I think the, the focus on privacy is very much appropriate. The point I would make though, is that healthcare is coming at data from a very different, almost the opposite vantage point uh, than the rest of the consumer world as we know it. Like when people think about privacy, they think about consumer data, they think about Facebook, they think about the sort of wild west nature of the internet and um, the, the use, almost uncontrolled use of data across the internet. And it, that absolutely needs to be a, a discussion in and of itself. But if you co contrast that with healthcare, in healthcare, we actually have walled gardens that are, you know, the walls are the HIPAA rules that essentially have kept data in silos within healthcare institutions that generate that data. So the challenge in healthcare is one of controlled release of that information from those silos. We don't want to just take all those silos down and have healthcare data turn into the wild west like the rest of the internet. However, it's very important that the data be able to move between those walled gardens and that patients have direct access to that information. And we can actually do that. That's not something that's technically difficult or impossible. In fact, I want to highlight a success story um, I don't know how many people track uh, what's happening in the digital sort of interop interoperability world these days, but one of the organizations that was uh, started maybe now seven or eight years ago uh, that facilitates clinical record interoperability is Commonwealth. Commonwealth has participation from literally dozens and dozens of EHRs that over the past five or six years now have put in place common standards-based interfaces that today actually move more than 25 million records every week from provider to provider. That's not a small number. So 25 million patient interactions are being facilitated because your data, the patient's data automatically shows up in your new physician's EHR without you having to provide that on a pad, right? As, as your medical history. That is terrific. And to the points that uh, Mike made earlier and Greg made, this is another example of true progress. And that's all being done without you know, stepping anywhere close to the boundary, if you will, of HIPAA constraints and violating any privacy. So it goes to show that we can do it. We can move a lot of data. We can, it's not aggregated, but you can move a lot of data when you need to. The next step is to make sure that the identity and authentication and consent management protocols that I was talking about earlier can actually be applied meaningfully across all these data sets so that it's not just the, the provider, but the patient and researchers, investigators can get similar access to that information. Uh, Mike, same question. Privacy of concern. Right. Um, I don't think it's a concern 
uh, with the underlying assumption of that uh, statement that we remain attentive and thoughtful to dealing with the concerns that are legitimately being brought forward and, and, and raised. And uh, again, in you know my optimistic tone today, I, I, I have a high degree of confidence that we will that we will do that. Um, you, you know, we, we do have this, uh, I like the metaphor that Chris used, we do have a framework that uh, I think most would uh, say has worked well for two and a half decades, uh, built on the, the, the HIPAA framework for healthcare. But there's this complex convergence occurring, right, in, in the consumer-based perspective of, of, uh, of, of privacy, for which I think there are a lot of legitimate questions. And the technologic innovations and the regulatory expectations um, that are that are uh, bringing those two worlds together, and so I think we're at a moment in time where we're going to have to deal with this. And the uh, frameworks that have been in place for a long time probably will need to evolve. I'd say almost certainly, but it'll be with a, a, an attentiveness to balance exactly what I think Greg already alluded to, which is the importance of maintaining. Uh, the individual's uh, need for transparency and 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 privacy with stifling the innovation that we know is so critical to driving healthcare improvements and uh, whether that's directly in patient care or through uh, through uh, through research. So uh, again, I'm I'm optimistic that we'll work it through uh, uh, in, a, in a in a really productive manner to get to the place that we need to for the rest of you know the rest of this century at least. Um, Greg Downing, in, in uh, answer to that question about privacy, I wonder if you might also uh, explain the difference between the, the HIPAA controlled world and the consumer uh, healthcare space. Uh, sure. Share with us, uh, which is, by the way, uh, outlined in the paper as well. But I'm not sure it's well understood that uh, the understanding of the use of data uh, it comes from uh, two different places. Yeah, first of all, you know, throughout this last year, uh, the learning journey and working with um, the member organizations that participated in this, it was so fascinating to hear the different perspectives throughout these companies and uh, the universe, research universities and from the patients to hear um, the perspectives on this. And, you know, you, all you had to do was ask the question and you got sort of a, uh, um, their premonitions about what potentially could happen that would be bad. And somehow that's wrong. Um, and, you know, PMC has done such a, an important job in its, um, you know, in its policy work and its advocacy work in the past on things like GINA uh, and, and with Cures Act and, and other public policy areas around this. We can't be, a, you know, we, we shouldn't be a, um, afraid to have these conversations it's important to have guideposts uh, where we're going into the future. And I recall back, um, this is a per personal story is that in 1996, as I was leaving the lab and entering the policy uh, shop at um, NIH uh, for the director at the time, um, Congress had enacted HIPAA, uh, Donna Shalala was the secretary and Congress was supposed to be writing the rules for which HIPAA was being applied. And at that time, it was really about insurance information. There were no HRs. No one knew anything practically about personalized medicine. This predated the completion of the Genome Project. But at the time, um, you know, it was the Department of Health and Human Services that wrote the rules around privacy and security in a non-electronic world. And it has stood the test of time from a general framework that everyone within healthcare knows that if you violate this sacred creed that we have as care deliverers with patients information, you know, the consequences are dire. You will stand civil or even criminal penalties. So there's a framework that's been part of the fabric of what I think is really about America, that we have these rules and regulations that are flexible to accommodate certain circumstances, but they're well understood in healthcare. Now, where are we today in that the EHR environment was pretty well protected. We knew the hospitals were, CMS pays for care during these, with these systems, plays an important role in the oversight. And that's a, a healthcare system that's evolved and we're 
been predictable and we've got frameworks around it, all sorts of protections and guideposts, lots of paper to sign, pretty inefficient in some ways, but it's getting better. And yet we have another framework that's evolving where the healthcare that people have and use their own health data that's not covered by HIPAA at all. And there are some federal guidelines with regard to FTC and FCC in terms of broader context of protections around consumer data. Some states, and I think this is where the challenge comes in for PMC, have not seen these protections uh, for consumer health data as being as robust and um, potentially as protective as, as what we have for HIPAA covered data, the healthcare data that you get from your doctor's office, your hospital. And so several states, um, you know them, have you know, developed their own policies and regulations around this. And what I think one of the big drivers for this is that we can't really afford to have 50 states do this. And then in some other communities that don't have a HIPAA equivalent in, you know, in Europe, uh, there's a broader framework that is probably more complicated to deal with. And for the multinational companies that are part of PMC, they told, told us very vividly about the, the, the concerns they had about bringing GDPR to the shores here in the US. So I think the framework, you know, <clears throat> we need to have a conversation about this is a bigger part of healthcare today than it was before. We integrate that information into the broader context of health and wellness in America, probably need to do something about that. And as you know, Ed, that um, Congress has been having conversations about this and there's, you know, draft bills around, um, protections around health data that aren't covered by HIPAA. And we don't know what that looks like yet, but I think that the optimistic part is that there's many people that recognize that this is a vital part of personalized medicine and that will, as we've done in the past, figure out a path forward to accommodate the necessary protections, but yet use that information to get people like Flora the care that they want. That's a good segue into my next question, uh, which goes beyond the issue of privacy. And the question is, what public policies would you like to see in place uh, to help us uh, accelerate the, the movement uh, uh, that allows the aggregation and analysis of data? Chris. So we've had um, a, tr a tremendous amount of progress, I think, on the regulatory front supporting um, interoperability of data. Now, you know, if you look at the rules that support and, and encourage interoperability, the 21st Century Cures Act was a big step forward, but you know, it was more than five years ago that it was actually passed. And it was, I think, the tail end of the Obama administration when it was passed. We're now uh, well beyond that, but now we have the new TEFCA rules that are getting ratified and that have come out and been formalized Along with those rules, we're going to have enforcement actions as well to prevent what's known as data blocking, which is another way of saying to encourage data sharing. So I feel that the work that the ONC is doing now under the leadership of Mickey Tripathi uh, is just terrific. They're really pushing the standardization of the data that's available through EHRs. All the US CDI data will be accessible and, and it'll be required. Uh, it'll be required uh, to be made available to APIs. So you don't have to go old fashioned ways, uh, through old fashioned ways to, to get at that data. It'll be available through modern APIs. Um, and I would also say that we're sort of, uh, to Mike's earlier point, we're sort of at the hockey stick inflection point now because we're going to go from just treatment oriented uses for that interoperability to um, other non-treatment related uses. And uh, for those of you who know HIPAA, they say that treatment payment and operations or TPO are sort of the normal HIPAA covered uses of, uh, of data. And that has been the focus as it should be. And with these interoperability rules coming on, um, it, is, um, it is the treatment part that's being emphasized along with patient access. But the payment and operations use cases are still not being emphasized or enforced. I think we need to go a step beyond that, that when we say TPO, it should actually be TPOR, that it should be treatment, payments, operations, and research. And when you put that research piece in, you can then say that everything that's empowered and, and enabled by HIPAA uh, and for patients and physicians 
it incorporates a learning health system because the research should be a constant ongoing process that happens. It's not just the, in the context of uh, a clinically controlled study. It should be constant research, constant understanding from every patient. And that's the essence of personalized medicine, isn't it? To have the data, not only for that patient, but also similar populations available for the physician so that AI-driven decision support systems can maybe tease out what might work for that one patient that might otherwise never be, be discovered. So um, I'll just say that uh, we need to make sure that uh, our public health infrastructure also keeps up. We need to understand how well vaccines are working or not working, or new therapies are working or not working quickly. And the real world evidence is key to making that happen. We should not have to look to data in other countries for early indications of what's working and what's not working. Yeah. We certainly have gaps today that, that we need to fill, but I think we're on our way to filling those gaps. And uh, like Mike, I'm very optimistic about the, the near-term future. Uh, Mike, you wanna amplify on that? I don't think I could have uh, said any better what, 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 what Chris just said uh, with respect to uh, our perspective of that interoperability and, um, uh, and, and, and thinking about uh, uh, data use. It's a convergence to the prior conversation in a way. I have to say, um, I am uh, really interested in the next set of conversations around, around privacy considerations and I'm incredibly sensitive to it as is, as is Flatiron. I have to say though, when you talk to patients with cancer um, and you ask them about using uh, their data for purposes of improving care or research, they're like, bring it on, like, like, like use it, you know, use it. So um, I think the perspective of privacy is important as we think about the use of the data. And it's going to be really important to keep that in uh, mind. In terms of other policy considerations beyond the work to bring uh, interoperability forward, um, I just want to reinforce the upcoming PDUFA reauthorizations, which I think are uh, really important in the context of real world data, real world evidence, and also um, make a strong uh, point of advocacy for Cures 2.0, especially the real world evidence um, task force, uh, uh, which is a component of that legislation. And just digress and say a word that um, the reason that I think um, uh, the, 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 the hockey stick metaphor works is because the stakeholders involved in this space, again, uh, at least in oncology, includes a really robust dialogue with regulators and with FDA in particular, who have um, um, leaned into this world in a variety of ways and uh, been real thought partners, uh, scientific leaders, and, um, and importantly, uh, beginning to provide specificity uh, with respect to the interpretation of, 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 of data and its use in a regulatory context. Uh, many of us know there are uh, several recent uh, very meaningful guidance documents. That's critically important for innovators in this space because when we know what that landscape uh, looks like, that allows us uh, to, to uh, bring our creativity and innovation in a way that we know is gonna meet the expectations uh, uh, there. Um, the only other thing that I'll say, just to be conscious of time a bit, is in terms of the infrastructure needed, um, uh, I think we need to be really conscious of that in terms of the, in, uh, the incentives that are going to be required in the coming years to drive the vision that's articulated in the white paper. And that really speaks directly to incentives at the uh, point where care is delivered, and also a, a very much of a consciousness of thinking about the way in which enhancing the um, accessibility to data and the way it's collected in a way that uh, at a minimum, an absolute minimum, minimum doesn't impede the ability for a healthcare provider to take care of his or her or their patient, but uh, actually uh, enhances that. So there's a lot more work to do, but uh, again, a place where I'm optimistic that the policy directions are, uh, you know, are, are, are really valuable to getting us there. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, Mike. That's a great, great answer to the question and amplified uh, what Chris said. Uh, Greg, what three things could Congress do in this session uh, to enhance our ability to move forward along the ways we'd like? Can you point to three public policies that you would like to see in place that are not there now? And I know you your answer to this question will be based upon the uh, years of, of experience and therefore the knowledge that it's not likely to happen that quickly. 
Yeah, well, I, I would say, Ed, that um, I really encourage the listening audience and others to, to um, dive into the paper a little bit. We put out a three-year horizon that, you know, includes um, uh, <clears throat> the, these policy areas. We've talked quite a bit about privacy today um, and the technical pol tech policies that need to unfold. I think there are some other dimensions that touch on the success for personalized medicine that are dependent upon data. Um, much work has been done, um, but more needs to be done along the lines of cures and care and care acts um, to address the health equity issues. Um, I think Mike talked about that in the very beginning, but um, the aspects of healthcare, whether it's an environmental data or the context of around, um, you know, the, the factors that influence uh, the the world that you live in are important antecedents to a lot of the disease and chronic care issues that we struggle with in this country are, are really rooted there. And so uh, personalized medicine is big enough to incorporate those broad goals that have social values tied to them. And um, there's an agenda behind that that personalized medicine can really benefit from. Uh, and so the, whether it's the uh, the addressing of the financial needs to support the infrastructure to support people who you know, don't have a device like this to be able to do their healthcare scheduling and yet have you know, multiple chronic diseases and don't have the transportation needs or the food so that, that to support their needs. So I think that the commitment around the social equity and the health equity issues are components to the broad work that we need to do as a country to be able to um, achieve that and data is a, is a key attribute of it. Some of the other areas that I think we haven't talked about today are workforce. I'm sure all of the companies here represented today struggle with the data science components to it. One of the aspects that I really loved about my time in HHS was that the data really represented such an opportunity for people who were not beholden to the constraints of healthcare, but could bring their talents from elsewhere. And this was a great driver for STEM education and, and for people that could come from FinTech or from other parts of the world to help solve really important problems that we need more of that. I'm, I'm sure all of you uh, recognize the constraints that we have with the talent pools today. That could be a pretty big blocker. So I think we need some creative thinking from Washington on how to address, um, you, you know, you don't need the physics degrees or the medical degrees like the people on this panel have to be key players in this. And we need to think creatively about how to put people who really understand these problems at, at work in solving public health issues or addressing the gaps in care. So that's another one I think is really a part, something that's true American is putting people to work on important problems. And I, and I do think I can't leave out um, you know, the continued advocacy for important investments and in research and that uh, much of the progress that we've made today are really on fundamentals that are steeped in publicly funded, uh, you know, peer reviewed investigator initiated research that really represents the driving engine for innovation for 50 years in the personalized medicine space and getting us here. And we need to keep, keep the fuels of innovation going there. You started us off before we, began into this discussion today about the, the public trust that's so important in this um, endeavor. And there's a ton of work that we need to do there. And I think all of us are committed to having conversations, hard conversations with the people who have been left behind. And that is a commitment that if we don't pay that price now to re recover from those lessons learned, um, we will come up again short in the personalized medicine endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let me ask in, in, in conclusion, uh, the $64,000 question, um, and uh, I, I, I won't hold you to this because uh, you're, you're entitled to be wrong, but uh, where, where are we going to be regarding uh, personalized medicine and data five years from now? Uh, let's go in the same order we've been in. Uh, Chris. Well, my answer is going to be somewhat optimistic here, but based on you know, things we are seeing, I'm not being hopelessly optimistic, in other words. So I would say three things. Now, first, I, I think that device data, device, uh, personal device data, 
will be incorporated more seamlessly with um, other medical information. A wealth of information, or especially around social determinants of health, does not sit in the EHR and it's really central for personalizing care. But along with that comes the need for consumer consent management, which has to be as easy as it is to do internet banking or anything else today online. And it's not just about gathering consent, it's about giving consumers control over their consent and they're two different things. So that's one. I hope that uh, real world evidence will help expand clinical trials in the community. And I hope that that will lead to some real examples at scale of uh, learning health systems that can combine the information they're gathering from patients in the community, incorporating that in research, driving studies, and then implementing the insights in care delivery. And finally, I would say that personalized medicine or personalized healthcare more broadly should become an expectation of patients in all care settings and not be an aberration for patients that are seen only in advanced medical centers. So I'll stop there. And I want to thank Greg for all the work and, and uh, PMC for putting out a terrific paper. I do encourage everyone to read it. Thank, thank you. And, and thank you for underlining uh, the agenda of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Um, Mike, where are we going to be in five years? Yeah, I've never, uh, never thought of myself as a futurist, but um, uh, to maybe uh, build on at least one of the three points that Chris made, um, you know, I, I, I think the paradigm we've been talking about today is shifting and the application that I see in the delivery of care and the way that research occurs in cancer um, will be fundamentally transformed. I think in five years, um, in uh, a certain uh, uh, extent or to a certain degree, and certainly by 10 years, we'll probably look back on 2022 and uh, see a point in time that's uh, uh, a bit quaint and probably a little bit anachronistic to the way in which we think about delivering cancer care in the United States uh, near the end of this uh, uh, decade. Um, and, you know, a, 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 a fact that feels to me doesn't get the kind of visibility that that it, it seems like it needs to in a uh, over and over repetitive way. The, the 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 if you'd have told me when I was a first year oncology fellow in the early '90s that we would be looking in 2022 at a more than 30 percent decrease in cancer mortality over the last 20 to 25 years uh, with curves that are Incredibly consistent in that regard, building to that uh, aggregate number. Um, I, I'm not sure I would have believed you. Um, and now we have a challenge uh, to do that again with a 50% improvement in cancer mortality in the next 25 years. I'm a lot more optimistic that we're going to pull it off, and we're going to pull it off in large part for a whole variety of reasons, but one of them is going to be exactly the topic we're talking about today in terms of the convergence of care. Um, uh, uh, the integration of, of that in uh, uh, research because of because of everything we've touched on. And um, it's super exciting. I'm up to the challenge. I know Flatiron is, and I know everybody on this call is as well. So let's do it. Thank you very much. Greg Downing, one minute. Where are we going to be in five years? Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think everyone should take the time to write the use case for that today. For me, I think it, it, I'll see it in rare diseases where it's just this blossoming of opportunity that's unfolding. Uh, I've, I want to take 10 seconds to just uh, thank Janet Woodcock for her extra extraordinary service and Rob uh, Califf, who's come back to run FDA. He's got an enormous role here to help play with this. Um, but I, I think uh, I want to just share with one last um, phrase from my conversation with Flora this week, and she says, I hope all of your efforts on personalized medicine make a great impact for many patients in the near future. It's very important to me that we have choices in, my health, in healthcare and that our country remains open for an educated personal input into their personal care. There is little doubt that our freedom for personalization input saved my life, but we have to fight for the approach to do that in doing so to continue the work with other patients and caregivers that we can overcome the obstacles that are sometimes so insurmountable that they give up and have no options. I like the freedom that I have where I've come to choose and what I can put into my body. And it is the reason why I moved to the US so long ago. 
We have the medicine doctors and nurses in this country to make everyone feel better about the efforts that we all care about. Thank you, Greg, for those uh, moving words. And let me close the hour by thanking uh, you, Greg, uh, for participating in the, this seminar, uh, helping us write the report, Chris uh, and Mike uh, for, for leading uh, PMC's work on this, and also uh, thanks extended to uh, Lauren Silvis, who similarly did so. This is the beginning of PMC's work, not the end. I hope you will uh, join us uh, in helping move this agenda forward and to stay in touch uh, with the Personalized Medicine Coalition as we address the data and other issues in personalized medicine. And finally, a big thanks to Chris Wells, uh, who was uh, my co-pilot in this. And, um, and with that, uh, I bid you a, a very nice uh, afternoon, uh, wherever you are. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Bye-bye.